All right, let's uh, continue from where we stopped. Uh, we looked at chapter three, and uh, let's move into chapter four. Let me just uh, share the notes. Okay, chapter three, now Paul has instructed the believers on how to, you know, uh, focus on true ministry and how God will, uh, you know, uh, judge his ministers. Now, chapter four, he talks about a lot of aspects, right? Now, chapter four, first Corinthians chapter four has a lot of, uh, you know, context in its Greek, right? So there's, there's a lot of stewardship, servanthood. Uh, and so we must understand the Greek so that we get a right understanding, right? Well, you know, we don't understand servants as somebody who's just, you know, when, you know, a bond slave who whatever somebody says we do. That's not the true meaning. But let's look at what Paul is trying to, in, you know, uh, encourage the church in this portion, right? So uh, let's pick up from chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Right? So the Greek word servants, I'm sure most of us know it, it's hoparides, which is a subordinate functioning, subordinate servant functioning as a free man. Right? So that's what the Greek word is a subordinate servant functioning as a free man, right? So he's not bound. A servant is not somebody who is like, you know, you have to do this only then uh, you will be blessed or only then I will give you your uh, income or your salary or only then will I give you food and anything, right? So he's trying, Paul is trying to bring that difference. He's saying, you are, let us consider let a let a man so consider us as hoprates, meaning a subordinate, but he's functioning as a free man. Right? Now, Paul chose not to use the Greek word doulos, which is a bond slave. Right? Why? Because a bond slave is somebody who has to do what has been assigned to him. Right? There's no willingness, there's no free choice there. Now, a hooprit is can work as a slave or uh, you know uh, be a servant for some time, and he can just go away because he's a free man. But a doulas means a born slave. So, for example, let's take this example. He has to work in this uh, in his master's house for three years. Now, after two years, he can't say no. I don't like you as a master. You give me too much of work. I'm going to go. He can't do that because he's. Uh, he's on a bond, right? There, there is a contract. Only then he can move out. So as servants of God, this is very important. When we say servant of God, you know, for many years I had the wrong picture of a servant. So whatever, you know, uh, it is, we have to do this. No, as servants of God, we must serve God willingly and out of our own choice, right? Because we are operators. We are not doulas. We're not a bond slave. Now, I, I know that Paul, later on, he says, I'm a bond slave. But again, he's referring to, uh, you know, his 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 attitude, his ministry towards Christ, to the, to the kingdom of God, right? But here he's saying, we are all servants, functioning, serving God out of our own free choice, right? The Greek word stewards here is oikonomos, and uh, a manager who's been put in charge of a place or a household to take care of it uh, uh, until the owner comes back or uh, take care of it as on behalf of the owner. And so we got two words there. One, hupredis, one, oikonomos. Now, here's interesting. Oikonomos means a manager put in charge of a household on behalf of the owner. Right. So when we look at ministry, we are put in charge as managing God's kingdom, God's work, God's field. We are managing God's field until the owner comes. And we know that in the book of Revelations, 
uh, you know, when the rapture happens, right? He'll come and he'll take the church, right? Uh, so, so it's it is on behalf of the owner. So we are not the owners of what we are doing, right? We may have started or even pioneered. Apostle Paul pioneered ministries, but he is himself is saying, "I'm just put in charge to take care." I'm a steward of what God has put in place on my life. I'm an oikonomos, just a manager. But Paul, didn't you start the church in Corinth? Did you, didn't you pioneer the church in Galatia and uh, Ephesus? Yes, I pioneered it. I started it. But God, it is God's work. I'm just a manager. Paul is inviting the believers right, uh, to see these three people, right? The Peter, Paul, and Apollos, to see them as servants of God, people who are willingly serving God, not, not as kings or rulers, but as servants, willingly choose to step down and to serve, right? And stewards of his mysteries. What is the meaning of steward? Right, we saw there, right? Uh, stewards, oikonomos, or manager. So God has revealed his wisdom upon his people on these three, Paul, Peter, and Apollos. And these three are just managers of what God has revealed to them. Now, this is the right way to view ministers of God. We as pastors, leaders, prophets, evangelists, we are not superheroes. We are not superstars in God's kingdom. Uh, and we are not to be expected to treat it that way, nor are we to treat people that way. Right? Uh, we are to conduct ourselves as servants and stewards of Christ. Now, when you look at you know, uh, things that are happening in, in the church globally, especially in places in the West, we see this whole attitude of stardom, right? We see stardom, superheroes. So they come, they just, you know, nobody should touch me. If anybody touches me, my anointing will go. So they come from the back, they preach, and they run away from the back. Right? Nobody can come near them. What is that? Now, why is it like that? It is one is because they're character or the they are they've misunderstood what being a servant is and two it is also the fault of us as believers to place them on a pedestal to make them our superheroes right it's it's not only their fault it's been our fault as believers it's the church's fault and we must be careful right now if we just treat them as people who are no, God is anointed because we honor them, we appreciate them, but they are just managing what God has given. Right? Now, it doesn't mean I, I dishonor a pastor or a preacher. I don't dishonor them. We love them. We say thank you, thank God for them, thank God that they are building the kingdom of God. But what is the bigger picture? They are stewards of Christ. Right? And so we must be very careful, very careful. And one of the things we intentionally in APC uh, we do is we treat everyone equally, right? Whether they are serving in the, you know, children's church or in the in the setup team, just even at the welcome lounge, or whether you're in the pastoral team, we're all equal. We're all stewards of Christ. Many times as pastors, we just go and stand in the welcome lounge, welcoming people. Are there volunteers? Yes. But even we also do it. Yes, so you know, to know that, hey, we are, we, we are also normal people. We are not superheroes. We are not super anointed. And the others are just, you know, uh, mildly anointed. No, we are all equal. Right? Verse 2, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful, right? The what is required in ministry is to be faithful. Now, uh, uh, you know, Jesus talked about being faithful in the parable of the talents. He said that the master rewarded two servants. There were two servants. 
he said okay here keep this money i'm gonna go i have some work i'll come back do what you please with it one takes it goes digs a hole puts it in there and then the other one goes and he uh you know uh, invests it and gets double he was a faithful steward right so god rewards faithfulness god rewards faithfulness uh now it can be the smallest of things nobody can even know that you're doing it god rewards that faithfulness right it could be serving tea we say god you know five years i'm in the church i've been serving tea past five years god rewards that faithfulness now it does not mean that you be comfortable serving tea the whole five years you should grow right grow in your gifts grow in your calling but god knows how to lead you right just be faithful trust god be sincere be dependable be trustworthy be accountable be reliable you know, serve god with a sincere heart you know just being pure being honest before god uh and you know when we serve god that way people will automatically recognize our faithfulness right god will reward it now it's not that god will only reward faithfulness when we go to heaven no he will reward us at the right time in the right way he will reward us just be faithful in the small things you know i'm just reminded of this and this is not to boast or uh anything but i'm just reminded of this i remember uh, many many years ago uh you know when i was in studying in the bible college uh, the worship team used to come and practice in the bible college right so i was in charge of the cleaning of the bible college so every day i would go and clean the entire college we had a team two three of us we go we clean the entire college and so this one day we had cleaned the college and we finished our classes afternoon the worship team came for practice and they came they practiced and you know everything was thrown like paper cups and chips packets and all kinds of things were just thrown everywhere i'm so upset now i used to think god i want to be in the worship team but all i'm doing is cleaning this bible college day after day after day it's been one and a half years now i'm just cleaning this uh, and these guys have come and dirty the whole place we have to sit and clean the whole thing again i was so upset that day i was just sitting and saying god i can't do this what is this but i remember the holy spirit telling me paul you be faithful you do nobody was there in the bible calls i was all alone and i just felt the holy spirit telling me a time will come for you now is not your time a time will come i will take you i will i will make you stand in front of people and you will do what you want to do but now you be faithful i said god this is not fun i like playing the guitar i like being in the worship team you know so for two years i was in charge of cleaning entire bible college clean the cobwebs clean the toilets uh, clean everything right and at the right time god opened the door right so being sincere being trustworthy and i thank god for giving me that because even now if you if i have to clean or if i have to you know clean a place or clean the toilet i don't mind doing it it's not like oh now I become a pastor no i should not do it no it's just that now we have other you know a lot of things to do and there are volunteers who will do it but if there is a need i will do it i, I remember we went to a church yesterday right uh, we saw a lot of you know things that needed to be done we just put our hands it's not like we walk into church and then sit there and say okay everything should be ready and i go and preach no right so i went i did all the work you know did carry the water cans filled water for people uh just made sure the cables are aligned properly set the chairs right it's okay right because we're being sincere just being tr trustworthy and when we stay these stay the course even when things are challenging god will reward it right now the problem with this generation of people is 
they say no no i can't do this this is what i will do nothing about apart from this and this this is what is it i am called to be pastor i will only preach we forget about being the you know being sincere we forget about how god works in people's lives if if that's the way god works in maybe your life that's great if you you know want to be a pastor immediately god takes you puts you you become a pastor good but if god is taking you through a series or a season of waiting and you're just doing some random thing which is not in line with your calling don't worry be faithful be sincere god will open the right door right so i just wanted to encourage you with that was 3 to 5 but with me it is a very small thing that i should be judged by you or by human court in fact i do not even judge myself for i know of nothing against myself yet i am justified by this but he who judges me is the lord therefore judge nothing before the time until the lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveals the counsels of the heart then each one's praise will come from god now paul is is he's just you know he's bringing his whole he's not even evaluating himself he's saying i am not concerned about what people think of me now that's a very difficult place to come at it's easy to say it hey i don't care what people think i'm sure many of us must have said that right i don't care what people think but deep down inside we do care right paul is saying i'm not concerned what people think right i'm not concerned about you know you, what people judge me with because i myself am not evaluating myself i am not saying i am a apostle how can you talk to me like that no he is saying uh, there's no point of you judging me or if you uh, or people judge me or if you take me to the court and you judge me all of this doesn't matter because he's leaving all the judgment to the lord himself he's saying so you can judge me right the court can judge me you can say hey paul you know you're mad because later on uh, when he's standing in front of uh, uh, agrippa king agrippa he says oh agrippa says the king says paul your learning has made you gone mad you have you don't know what you're talking you're talking so well so eloquent but it's your learning is too much right but what does he say hey i it doesn't matter who i stand for of all that matters is that am i doing the right thing or oh, what if people are saying oh paul you are the greatest apostle ever you will you know you have done this you have done this that also i don't care because i'm not evaluating myself let the lord say that then that is some encouragement for me if god says okay you know uh, paul you have done a wonderful work if jesus says you know paul because of you the one third of the new testament you wrote you have done a wonderful job then he will delight in that because the lord jesus is telling him that does he boast yes he does paul says no i don't boast in myself but i boast in the lord if the lord boasts about me i boast in the lord if the lord says paul good job well done good and faithful servant i boast in that because the lord jesus is saying it not any person so this is so important right uh, that the lord judges the motives of our heart Uh, right it's not the significance it's not the size it's not the fame it's not the money it's not the uh, it's not the things that we have in this world that we have attained it is not how many sermons we have preached it is not about how well we have preached were we eloquent in our speech it is why we have preached those sermons what is the motive why did you preach why did you lead worship because nobody else was there okay there will come times that way but even when you're leading what was in your heart right was it for fame was it for self actualization was it for recognition was it for human accolades was there competition in your heart now these things are things that only we will know right we're not going to go and tell our friend you know what i preached a sermon today now i think i'll become famous no we will not tell our friend 
but if we have thought it in our heart it's it's a waste the sermon the entire sermon is a waste right so why it's not about what we are doing it's about why we are doing it also so paul is trying to tell the believers here we are stewards of the mysteries of god now we are servants of christ but why are we doing this for the glory of god it's not that i can brag about it to one person it's not about not so that i can be proud or show to others that i'm better than the other person no right then he goes on the next verse he says verse 6 now these things brethren i figuratively transferred my transferred to myself and apollos for your sakes that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written right that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other paul is stating here that he that he and apollos and all the corinthian believers must get a clear understanding that it is not about us it's not about Paul. Remember, Paul sent Apollos and uh, sorry, uh, Aquila and Priscilla sent Apollos to Corinth, and he did a wonderful work there. So, so now it's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not so that we can brag about it to each other. We must not take sides. We must not promote one servant of God to the other. God has appointed us. God has gifted us. God has um, anointed us differently for his sake for the ministry like all of us all people and all ministries are appointed and anointed and gifted in different ways but everything is from the lord you know there was a couple of uh i'll leave the preacher unnamed but i just came across a couple of sermons here on uh youtube and i happened to listen to it it was sounding good it was a nice sermon so i kept listening to it and the preacher goes on to say that if not for me this church you know will be nothing it is because of the anointing of god on me that you are coming here so when you come here make sure that you honor the leader and he goes on to say in that message, the past, the preacher, the pastor of the church. And it really, you know, it made me sad to hear this. He goes on to say that if only 100 or 150 people are coming for these meetings, I will not come from tomorrow because I have other places where people will come in thousands. Now, what can we get from this? It's not about you know, I've, I felt this is so wrong. This is not what ministry is about. Even if there are three people sitting there as a pastor of that church, we must be willing to teach those three people and preach to them and minister to them because it's the Lord's work. It is God's kingdom. Right? You never know. Those three people can become great ministers of God, touching thousands and millions of people. How, who are we to judge what's happening? Right. And this man, just for 15, 20 minutes, he just kept shouting at the entire congregation. And it's being recorded. And he just shared something for 10 minutes, and he closed. And I thought to myself, this is the problem when we think we are too famous. This is the problem when we want fame or recognition, human accolades. We forget the reason why we are doing ministry. Paul is telling the believers, listen, as servants of God, let us do it in an honorable way. Right? Then he goes on the challenges of apostleship. Right? Before I go ahead, any questions? Anything you'd like to share? And I'm sure many of us may have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, you may see it, you know, once you step into the ministry. Uh, uh, and you know one thing i always say to people is now there will be people you know ministers of god very gifted very uh, anointed but their lifestyle is not in line with god 
right? They may be walking in pride or walking with, you know, this whole thing of famous and all of that. Now, the best thing to do is not to judge them, but to just leave it. Choose somebody, listen to something else, right? Because the more we talk about them, think about them, we begin to judge them, what is happening? We are being carnal. Right? So many people have asked me, see, this this preacher or this pastor is a wonderful pastor, but he doesn't believe in this, what to do. Listen to them, take what is important, and move on. Right? You always have the word of God. You can be your own teacher. Just ask the Holy Spirit to teach you, to train you. And there is so much available online, material, commentaries. Just learn. Right? It's not that you have to listen to preaching. Preaching is good, right? But learn for yourself, right? Um, so I want to leave you with that, right? Okay, let's go to verses 7 through 13. Uh, let's do 7 and 8 first. Verse 7. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you have had not received it? You are already full. You are already rich. You have reigned as kings without us. And indeed, I could wish you did reign, that we also might reign with you. Now, there's a play of words here. right? Uh, and that's why he's so brilliant in his writing, the Apostle Paul. Paul rebukes the Corinthian believers for their behavior, right? Now, he rebukes them because it is pride which made them come to this conclusion that, you know, Paul is better, Apollos is better taking sides, right? It is pride. So then he comes up, he challenges them with three questions here. Who makes you differ from one another, right? So Paul is saying, He's putting this into context. He's saying, what makes one group superior to another group? Right? Or what makes one minister of God or one ministry superior to the other ministry? Right? Uh, so he's asking the question. How can you say that Paul is and better and Apollos is better? How can you say that? How can you differentiate that? By what context are you di differentiating that? Right. So he's asking the question to them. How do, how did you make this differentiation that Paul is better? Apollos is? is it through our preaching? Is it because Paul is you know I started the church, and later I sent Apollos and Apollos built on it, or is it because Apollos has a better speaking style, or Apollos looks better and I'm you know not good looking? What is it? that made you differ from one another. And he goes on to say, we are one body. Right? In many places, Paul writes, right? Uh, later on also he writes, uh, can the hand and the legs be departed from the body? Can the hand say to the eyes, don't do this work? Or can the eyes or the head say to the body, don't do this? No, we're all joined together in one body. Now, I can't say, oh, my uh, eyes are not that important. So you take one eye, and my hand, I don't need two, so maybe one is enough. But instead of the hand, you give me another uh, you know, mouth, so I'll have two mouths. We can't say that, right? What makes you differ from one another, he's asking. Right, now, this is a very important lesson for us. If we have come to a place of comparing ministries and saying this is better than that, we must refrain from it, right? Now, we can compare in the sense by saying, hey, you know what, this ministry deals with you know, understanding the prophetic, so I really like this. Right? But this, is, this other ministry has got another essence. They deal with interpreting dreams and uh, visions. So, you're comparing them, but you're not comparing as to which is superior or which is better. You're just saying 
this has its own essence this has its own essence both are important both are done for the body of christ right so that's what he's trying to say who on what basis are you bringing this differentiation of paul and uh, apollos so we can ask this to ourselves when we're talking about two different ministries on what basis are we saying this is better and that is not better or this is superior to that ministry there's no basis because jesus himself says we have one body right then he goes on to the second question what do you have that you did not receive so this is interesting paul and apollo paul is saying now whatever i have is what the lord jesus has given me right everything that i have has been given by god everything that apollos has has been given by god okay so the wisdom that i have or the knowledge of knowing all of judaism i learned before i became a believer that's also given by god only the mouth that i have to speak the ability to write the ability to understand revelations of god the ability to plant churches to travel to places pioneer churches all of this has been given to me by god right and apollos his oratory sp skills his preaching skills uh, the anointing upon him is given by god so whatever we have we cannot boast that it's ours but what did you get that you have that is your own so paul is putting that to the church what do you have can you say that you have the gifts of the spirit is yours you have you got it on your own can you say you have you know received jesus on your own ability because we have preached you received on your own right so he's trying to uh, get the church to think right saying did you receive anything that you have on your own right now as a church you have the gifts of the holy spirit god has blessed you you have you know you're anointed you're you're making an impact in corinth but have you received it on your own because apollos peter and me have not received it on our own we have received it from christ so then he goes on if you did receive it then why boast as if you did not receive it so he's trying to say now you know you've received whatever you have from god so why do we have to boast that it's our own accomplishments or we've achieved this on our own selves right you you see how paul is trying to make them understand he's opening up questions to reveal the answers to them that is a sign of a good leader jesus asked a lot of questions right asking questions opens up the assumptions for the questionnaire itself so he says what did you receive on your own now as a reader i'll say lord nothing nothing i've received on my own god you only have given me then why do you act as if you've received it on your own ability so the same way if you've not received on your own ability apollos peter and me that's paul we three have not received it on our own it is from god so now who's greater right. so he's trying to bring everything he's trying to make them understand now these three questions are very important for us today god has imparted in our lives imparted to us through ministries and this does not in any way make us superior to any of the other believers and we talked about it last class as well right i may not be able to speak in tongues or if i'm speaking in tongues and somebody else cannot speak in tongues doesn't mean i'm superior or if i'm led by the prophetic and somebody else is not prophetic by nature does not mean i am superior right we have different streams different expressions uh, now uh, teaching even in the ministry teaching or preaching everyone have different styles you will never find two people with the same style of preaching we, they have different styles different way of speaking different uh, you know way of putting up examples different way of preaching a sermon 
there are some who speak slow some who speak fast there are some with in different intonations some have a low voice some have a loud voice some like to scream some don't like to scream they just like to be quiet and just preach but here's the point it does not mean that you know the louder we are the more anointed we are no right uh, we should come out of all these false assumptions, false judgments. Right? Just because we scream hallelujah three, four times does not mean we are stronger than the other person who's just preaching normally in a normal voice. Right? We must learn to flow together as God's people. Right? Uh, verse 8, Paul is using sarcasm and he rebukes the attitude of the Corinthians. Right, let's read verse 8, right? It's interesting to see that. Verse 8, he says, You are already full. You are already rich. Right now, now before that, you are saying, you know, Who makes you differ from who are you to make this judgment? Then he's saying, You are already full. He's being very sarcastic here. Right? You're already full. Uh, you know, you're already rich. Uh, but he's trying to tell them, I wish you were really reigning. Then you would, then you would really know who would have reigned inside you. Who is, uh, you know, what is this ministry all about? But you are not full. You are not rich because of all this carnality that you all are showing, right? Okay, verse nine onwards. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles last as men condemned to death for we have been made a spectacle to the world both to angels and to men verse 10 we are fools for christ's sake but you are wise in christ we are weak but you are strong you are distinguished but we are dishonored right now paul he's outlining the challenges and the hardships and he's trying to tell them now you people are saying oh, paulus is better paul is better Okay, now I'm trying to. I'm telling you that ministry is not easy. There are challenges. There are hardships. Right, verse twelve he says, and we labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless; being persecuted, we endure; being defamed, we entreat; and we have been made the filth of this world. You see the things that is happening to them now. In a day and age that we are living in, we may not go through all these hardships, even though certain places or certain nations may be going through all of these challenges, right? Constant persecution, constant ridicule, constant uh, mockery of Christianity. Uh, but if we are not face, if we are not facing it, we must be, you know, we are blessed. But if we are facing it, Paul is bringing out the truth and he's saying, see, this is what it is. Ministry is not just, you know, everything goes on well or smoothly and everything will be, you know, fine. No, we go through challenges, we go through hurdles, we go through persecution. People curse us, but we bless them. We are treated like the filth of this world. Right Now, remember, um, in Philippi, you know, uh, Paul and Silas, they were put into prison. They were beaten severely and flogged and put into prison. Their hands and legs were chained. Now that doesn't look like a good picture, right? Beaten severely and flogged severely, hands and legs chained. And now you all are fighting about you know, who's better, Paul or Apollos. Right? So you, you see how Paul is trying to bring things across. He's trying to say, hey, it's not a nice, it's not always you know, uh, uh, a title that we should be pleased about. We must also be willing to take on challenges. We must also go through the challenges and hardships of serving people. Right? It's not just a title that we see now, right? You come in a car or a private jet, you preach and you go back to your luxurious house. That's not what it is. We should be willing to face threats, challenges oppositions that come our way that's what ministry is all about if there are no threats no oppositions no challenges praise god but be ready for them be ready to take them on don't run away from the challenges don't run away from oppositions what does jesus say 
I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When you have that attitude, right? Uh, it's like Paul is saying, I'm going to advance the kingdom boldly because the gates of hell shall not prevail. Right? Uh, so, so I want to just encourage us, you know, it's wonderful to have a calling to be a pastor, prophet, evangelist. It's wonderful. It's very important that we understand what our calling is. But in a day and age that we are living in, we must also be willing to sacrifice. Paul says he sacrificed so much. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was flogged. Now, we may not be shipwrecked, beaten, and flogged, but what are some of the challenges or sacrifices we must do? Maybe spend additional time in God's word, spend additional time in prayer. But others are all enjoying, they're going out, they're enjoying their time. And why is it that only I have to read the Bible and I have to keep praying the whole day? That's a sacrifice, right? Because God has called you for that. Now, that that may look as a challenge, but if you enjoy doing it, it's wonderful. Right? It's going to be a sacrifice. You know, waking up early in the morning, praying. Everyone, Lord, everyone is sleeping till nine o'clock. Why is it that I have to get up early? It's a sacrifice. Right? If you're choosing ministry, you have to take be willing to sacrifice. It's not only the good things, right? There's there's a season of teaching and training and sacrifice that is involved be willing to take it up right then the apostle paul has you know maybe he felt oh i'm being too harsh to them let me change my tone and he goes on and he changes his tone right because remember he he was sarcastic he said you are full and, uh, maybe he would have felt i should not be talking this way and verse 14, he says, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. What a heart of a spiritual father. He's saying, I, I, I don't write this to shame you. I don't want you to feel ashamed when you're hearing this being read to you. But I'm writing so that you understand and what is ministry all about. You are my beloved children. Right? For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. Right? Now, Paul is expressing his heart. He's referring to the children, uh, to the believers in Corinth as beloved children. What happened in verse 3? He's saying you're carnal. You're carnal people. You're, you know, you're living by the flesh. And here he's saying, you're my beloved children. You see how wonderfully Paul is able to, you know, just bring correction and love them the same way. He's saying, there are many people who will teach you, instruct you, but I am the one who have brought you into Christ. As a father, I'm telling you what is right, what is good for the ministry, what is good for your life. Because God used them uh, God used Paul to bring them to the faith, right? And uh, and so he uses this word instructor, uh, a, a tutor, a schoolmaster, right? Uh, we'll skip the Greek words there. But what is a spiritual father? Quickly, we look at this, a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. Now, you know, I'm sure all of us may, may have used this, right? He is my spiritual father. Or he is my spiritual mother. Now, what is the characteristic of a spiritual father or a mother? All right, let's look at it quickly. A spiritual father or a mother is one who not only births people into the kingdom, but takes them from a place of immaturity to maturity. All right? So Apostle Paul is saying, you came to know the gospel through my ministry. Now, I'm not just, okay, not like I planted the church, Apollos is there, now it's Apollos' headache, no. I have to take you as a father, I have to take you from this place of immaturity to maturity, to understand, to correct them, and help them to move into a place of maturity. And, and that should be the heart of a father, or a heart of a mother, each one of us, uh, is to help people 
from a place of immaturity to maturity to a spiritual father or a mother recognizes and allows sons and daughters to receive instruction nurture training and equipping right now the moment a spiritual father or mother demands their sons and daughters uh, listen to no one except them it is a big danger right now see we must have we must be able to draw a line a spiritual father and a mother can tell us teach us instruct us build us now for example you know this has happened many times when you know there's this one lady who was so close to the pastor uh, and you know whatever like a spiritual father she always looked at this pastor but this pastor once said to her you sell your property and give that to the church we will build a church and god will bless you now what she did was she said okay and she took that property she sold it gave the entire amount to the church they built the church many years later the children came and said where's that property let's uh, you know probably build a house on it and let's go live and she says no i sold it and i gave it to the church and the children were in shock they were in uh, they were upset they were shocked why did you do this no the pastor told me to remember that when a person is controlling the other person you know uh, and trying to behave like a father or a mother but is controlling he is not a father or mother it becomes a cult it's a red flag it's danger it's you got to run away from it make things right don't stay in that kind of a relationship right because there are many many situations where you know this spiritual father mother said you know you have to get married to this person only then your life will be blessed and they've got them married and their life is just miserable and then the spiritual father or the mother says y'all have to work it out y'all are not praying y'all are not doing this that's wrong right but they must not be controlling our lives so maybe some of us could be in this place prayerfully ask the holy spirit to give you wisdom and come out of it right uh, a spiritual father and mother must only set an example to their children to imitate christ right they were to raise their sons and daughters by equipping them in the god's word teaching them and the goal is to bring spiritual maturity and not for you know these earthly matters right so we must be very careful this whole aspect of spiritual father and mother is is a challenge and we must uh, be very careful right uh, in a day and age that we are living in be careful right uh, they may be the most anointed person that's why one of the things we do in apc is you know, we we encourage people they come to us for questions we give them the option we give them an option we help them we give them the option we say see this is something that you can do right and we have conferences we have school of ministries we have things that can have that's why we have you know um, you know professionals workshop how to save how to invest now we don't tell them you have to do it like this you have to do it in the stock market you have to no we give the option to them but we tell them hey investment is important invest invest for your future how you do it is up to you right so we don't force people a spiritual father and mother knows how to bring correction in a loving way and how to deal with people with gentleness and kindness right so paul here is is just expressing perfectly the attitude of a, a spiritual father and mother finally verse 20 for the kingdom of god is not in word but in power wonderful greek word for greek for the for word is logos which means it's not an idea the kingdom of god is not an idea or a speech 
It is power, which means dunamis. It is miraculous strength and power. Right? So we must live by this, right? The kingdom of God is not in word, the Greek word logos, which means it's not a idea, it's not just speaking out of our own head, but it is the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, the strength of God, the miraculous power, the dynamis, dynamite power of God touching and blessing lives. So we're not just, you know, Paul is saying, I'm not just communicating words here, but and good teachings, but we are transforming lives, lives that will bless the kingdom of God. Right? All right, so we've completed two chapters. That's good. Uh, yeah, uh, anybody have any thoughts, any questions? Right, I hope each one is tracking along. And uh, most importantly, I, I truly hope that each of you are going to apply this uh, in your life and in your ministries, right? Great. So uh, let's just quickly close in prayer. Uh, let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful time, Lord. Thank you for your word and teaching us. I pray, God, that you bless us. Bless us, bless the students, Lord, even as they continue to learn. May your grace and mercy be upon them, Lord. May, they, may you anoint them for your glory and your power, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.